<laughs> okay. I think uh, what Monia read brought us to the Carl and Walker, to Carl and Laura Walker generation. So I wanted to tell you something about Carl Walker and his personality. Um, I, I wish you could have all known him because uh, he had a very, very colorful personality. Now for the young people here, I've got to use some profanity to really portray his true self and personality. So if your kids haven't heard it before, they're going to learn a few words. <laughs> like I said, he's very uh, had a very personal uh, personal uh, personality. He, couldn't, he never met a stranger. Um, just so colorful, you you can't imagine how colorful he was. But he was to tell you a little bit of how he was passionate, intense, and emphatic in everything he did and said. There's no halfway about him. Well, the mic is not broadcasting. She needs to project. Okay, project. The mic only goes to the camera. I shall try to project. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dad was a very colorful person. He had a. He was just passionate, intense, and emphatic about everything. Can y'all hear that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you never had to worry about where you stood with him. He was. There was no halfway about him. He could be happy with a great sense of humor, so mad that everyone stayed out of his way. And uh, you could tell what mood he was in. If you walked up to him and his eyes were squinted and he may be gnashing his teeth a little, you knew to keep your distance. If you walked up and he was relaxed with his big blue eyes, maybe singing a song or something, all was well. Um, but he did have a very volatile personality disposition. Uh, to say, I've heard it say that Carl had a gift of gab. <coughs> to say he had a gift of gab was actually an understatement. He was a super salesman. He could sell anything and he could convince anyone of anything, true or not. Uh, after retirement, that little example, I heard Jiggs telling uh, one example of this. I'll tell another one that I heard. Um, after, I think it was after he retired, he I guess he missed his selling jobs. He met, started manufacturing a soap, and he sold this to just individuals. He had sold chemicals for a um, janitorial or service, I guess it was, before, and he knew the ropes on this. But I had a friend tell me that he came to her selling soap that he had manufactured, and he was telling her how good it was. And he said, if you... Uh, use it to bathe. You'll just have the softest skin imaginable. If you, uh, if you want to clean the floors, if you happen to have little ants, any kind of insects, it cleans the floor so well and it'll kill the insects. And he said it just makes the wonderful, a wonderful shampoo, makes your hair so soft and shiny. And she said, now Mr. Walker, if that's strong enough to kill bugs, what if it makes my hair come out? And he said, you'll get your money back. I'll return, I'll return your money. <laughs> and uh, he was not afraid of anything or anybody. Maybe, maybe because of his temper. I don't know. He, he was a fighter and uh, he didn't take anything off of anybody. But um, I had another story I heard somebody telling. I didn't see it, but they said in his late years in Littlefield, a new courthouse was built and they had marble walls and it was very pretty and dad uh, got a job as a janitor there so on rainy days in West Texas farmers can't get in the field to work so they come into town to visit and talk so he um, saw a couple of farmers <clears throat> in this courthouse uh, muddy feet and out in the rain one of them they were backed up to one of these marble walls visiting one of them had his foot back behind him with a muddy boot against the wall and these were young men about uh, hefty um, strong men about 35 40 and so dad walks up to him and he always puts his hand like this say fella he says say fella I wonder if I could ask you to get your muddy boot off of this uh, wall I said we're really proud of our new courthouse and trying to keep it nice and this uh, farmer said well now, Mr. Walker, what part of this courthouse do you own? 
Boy, he got mad. He said, I'll tell you one thing. I don't own any of this courthouse, but I'm going to own a piece of your, you know what, if you, if you don't get your damn foot off of that. That was, that was common language for him. That tells you something about it. he's not afraid of anything and his quick temper. Well, he had musical talent. He could play instruments, sing, and dance. He never forgot a song once he learned it or heard it. He sang at home when he was relaxing. I can see him sitting on the front porch just singing a song in the evenings. And he took off and often took walks. He sang when he was walking. If he's melancholy, he sang sad songs. If he is happy, he sang happier ones. Um, he also had a very, he just a fantastic vocabulary. I don't know how, I never saw him read a book in my life. He was just born articulate, I suppose. But anyway, he, uh, he could talk anybody into anything and use the biggest word I ever, words I ever heard. But he also prayed eloquent prayers. I went to church with him one time, and the preacher said, uh, Mr. Walker, could I ask you to dismiss the service, please? He said, certainly. He prayed the most beautiful prayer you, ha you can imagine. I just, you know, it was just so beautiful, and I was so proud of him. And we went out and got in the car to leave, and a lady started backing up close to us, and he said, well, I'm GD, look at that son of a bitch. She's going to hit us, you know. <laughs> anyway, he loved his family dearly and would not tolerate being mistreated by anyone, us being mistreated by Now, he might mistreat us, but he didn't want anybody else to. That's kind of like the Walker siblings. They can, we can talk about each other, but don't anybody else talk about us. <laughs> he loved to go to Saturday movies, Saturday Western movies. He loved watching the horses and the horsemanship, the cowboy guitar playing and the singing, and was impressed with Western law enforcement, Western day law enforcement. He enjoyed visiting friends downtown. Uh, on Saturdays, farmers all go to town and they stand around on the streets and visit. And Daddy just loved all that visiting. He, he'd stand around down there visiting. And uh, he also would like, he liked going in drugstores and having milkshakes on Sunday. Or if he's a little bit hungry, he might go in a restaurant or a cafe, as they called it, and have a bowl of chili. Um, <clears throat> everyone in town knew him, and he knew everyone. And, um, but he had his first heart attack in 1945. And uh, I really couldn't count the times I've heard him telling this story. He, especially on a Saturday downtown, he'd meet up with these guys. He said, my old ticker went out on me in 45. That's what he always said. <laughs> Have you ever heard that, Zan? My old ticker went out on him in 45. And uh, when he, I don't know if you'd call him a hypochondriac or not, but when he had a headache or was feeling poorly, nobody ever felt that bad. He put his hand up here and somebody say, mother, spoiled him to death. Carl, are you feeling bad? Always his, I don't care what was wrong, I'm damn near dead. <laughs> That's always said, I'm just damn near dead. <laughs> And one time he was feeling really nervous about something, and he felt like he was shaking. A train came through with our old house, the windows shook, and a train came through, and he said, oh my God, he thought he was shaking the windows. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he was very, very impatient. Um, he hated waiting on anything. Little Phil had two traffic lights in town on their main street. And when he had to stop at a traffic light, this is what he would say. I've heard it, huh? Well, I'll be damned if it's not one of those damned hour-long lights. <laughs> <laughs> Television commercials just irked him to death. He it to me, too. <laughs> when he got his first TV set, which was way back, he liked to watch wrestling. And having been a wrestler one time himself, he really got into the matches. And uh, I can see him now on the edge of his chair, really up there with him, you know, and uh, absorbed completely. And I just remember this particular uh, commercial that would come on for Viceroy Cigarettes. And they advertised 10,000 fibers, I believe they called them in their little filters to filter out. And so when that came on, it made him so mad. He'd sit back, take a deep breath, and he said, well, I'll be down. Why don't you just, why don't you tell us all about your 10,000 little doodities? <laughs> <laughs> he liked his clothes to fit just right. 
he had a short neck like a lot of us walkers. <laughs> and um, some of his shirts, he wore these chambray, cotton chambray shirts with his mother had fixed them with a starched collar. And uh, sometime they were too high for his short neck. And he'd go around, say, the damn thing, push your head off. <laughs> If the sleeves weren't just right on the shirt, and I have seen him in work clothes where the elbows start wearing out, he'd go. <laughs> Mother say, what's the matter, Carl? Oh, this damn shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I just had some quotes written down that um, uh, for somebody one time, I think it's for Johnny, when we had a web page before and we never got around to them. But here's some of the quotes my, uh, of my dad to his children in certain situations. Uh, we fought a lot, <laughs> the kids did. When siblings argued, the other one started or he hit me first. He always said, two wrongs don't make a right. And when one of his children displeased him, now Darla, you can, rem you can remember this, we, he said it to us a thousand times. Now don't you think you're cute? <laughs> he says, you'll just do anything to antagonize. You just try yourself, don't you? You've heard all of them, haven't you? <laughs> and when mother needed help in the kitchen, of course, Vita was always in there helping her anyway, but the rest of us sat in there and we didn't know when she needed help because she never told us. Daddy would come in there and he'd say, you girls get off your damn cans and get in the kitchen to help your mother. <laughs> when a daughter complained about the way her hair looked, he always said, just put a little red ribbon not a ribbon, but a ribbon. Just put a little red ribbon in it and you'll look sweet. <laughs> and when a child had been crying, our eyes got red. And he said, my God, honey, your eyes look like two holes in a red saddle blanket. <laughs> uh, when a daughter became too slender, that was me, my God, honey, you have to stand twice to make a shadow. <laughs> and sometimes the boys worked awfully hard and if they wanted to sleep late on weekends, he could not stand it. He'd go in, he'd walk, you know, grit his teeth, he'd go into the bed and he'd say, you lay out all night, no, you, yeah, you lay out all night and pile up in bed all day. I bet Jigs remember that. <laughs> remember that, Jiggy? Ah, <laughs> oh, that's about all on Carl. We all loved him and we knew he loved us. He's just a spoiled brat. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, that's when he's downtown on a Saturday. I didn't see this either, but I heard it. Uh, there was a, the biggest church in, in Littlefield. It was the First Baptist Church, and a little prestigious, I guess. But the minister was walking down Main Street. Dad was standing on the street talk, talking to men. And uh, the, this minister uh, passed by. His name was Hemphill. Dad took his hat off. Good afternoon, Brother Hemphill. He looked around and just kept walking. Daddy says, go to hell, Brunther Hipfield. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just... <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs>